lunch. Um, so next up we have Ben Martin and the talk is called Terry and the Path to an Autonomous Robot. Please make him welcome. Alrighty, um, I've decided to do strange slides where they don't have a whole bunch of text on there. It's more or less me ad-libbing text based on what I'm seeing, which makes it harder for me, but perhaps hopefully more interesting as a uh, person in the audience. So on the left side, I have a collection of the robots that I've been working on uh, leading up to the large one, which is roughly about this high uh, with two connects, pan tilt system, weighs about 15 kilograms. Um, and the two motors on it I had to upgrade, so they've got about 10 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, because I discovered that I'd made the robot heavier and heavier and then I went to actually start doing mapping and discovered that it wouldn't move on carpet anymore. So that's always lots of fun. Um, theory, we have my... Uh, there we go. Always good to flick the video. So instead of having robots that move inside, I've now started uh, working on robots that work outside, which uh, changes things because you have to go up and down hills and have suspension. And uh, so this thing has similar sort of motors that will stall at 20 amps of power, which you need to have larger cabling and things to handle that. Uh, but I think it sort of dismisses the image that the robot has to be uh, only moving about walking pace. And I have no idea where my slides have disappeared to. This is wonderful. Excellent. All righty, so back with slides again. Uh, so this was the, uh, the problem when you start, I uh, originally a software engineer and then I started playing around with electronics and then at some point I built an audio player and had it running off batteries and then I got a hold of some cheap motors and built this thing. Uh, which I decided to constrain myself to only spending $100 to build and try and build it in less than 24 hours, which all succeeded nicely. Uh, at the core of it is a 328 Atmel chip, so basically the same thing you get on the Uno and a lot of other uh, microcontroller chips. In order to have a screen, a RF24 radio, and the uh, two backward-facing LEDs with microcontrollers and the dual H-bridge all attached to the 328, I had to remap some of the analog pins so there's, it's basically the micro is at capacity as far as its I.O. goes. Uh, when it's not moving, I turn, put the lights backwards so they don't blind people. But when it doesn't move, uh, the lights are red, showing you that it's not going anywhere. And this is the second iteration of the uh, hand control, uh, which is basically my cardboard carpentry. Uh, much, much easier to poke holes in cardboard and shove things in. Uh, switch on the side, internal AA batteries. And just so this thing doesn't sort of decide to go anywhere, I'll pick it up. Uh, but when you're moving forward, you've got differential drive, uh, left and right. And I found that um, having LEDs or some sort of quick visual feedback on a robot is extremely handy. Um, I was looking at the videos for the NASA Autonomous Robotics Challenge, and they'd mounted um, speakers on the robot. So when it was about to find a goal or it thought something interesting had happened, it would tell you. And I thought that was just a wonderful way, instead of having web interfaces and things like that, just you get that immediate, this is what I'm doing, I'm not going to hit that tree, don't worry. Um, you know, I think I've found what I'm picking up. And you say, no, that's actually a galah, it's not the little white thing you're actually looking to pick up. But if it was a galah, you could sell it for quite a lot of money in the US. Um, this thing keeps sending ping messages over, and it's another great thing. When I turn this off, it's gone blue, so I can immediately see when I've lost communication which I've done many times with this, and it sort of runs into a table. But it's great for other people also to know. Like, I know that it's not responding to my stick, but as soon as there's blue light, someone else will know that this thing's gone rampant, which is a huge plus. It's interesting bringing this on a, on a flight as well, because I put this into my, um, check, my luggage that I brought onto the plane, and I sort of turned up and said, you might want to have a look at this. And they, you know, apparently that's not a phrase that the airline security like to hear. <laughs> Um, but if you've got uh, aluminium and you've got wires, and technically this could be a clock, but uh, <laughs> I left the real-time clock feature at home just to sort of survive. Uh, the large board that I've drilled two holes in with seven-segment displays, the protocol basically is an uh, analog read off the joystick, and the two displays show X, Y position. So with something like this, when I was playing around with autonomy, the back of the channel, I can mount something else on and have it actually transmit the same as the joystick would. 
So the back end could have cameras on it, which are mounted here. And I was playing around with dropping a ping pong ball in a cup, like the, the Spark Fun Autonomous Challenge. But this is very handy to have the board. And again, it's a, one of those things with RF24, you can have many devices, and there's nothing stopping you from sniffing the network. So you can see what the joystick's doing. And you can see if buttons have been pressed or little messages like I've discovered where the beer bottle is. Um, and if anyone wants to see the, uh, see the little monster that I've got here, then feel free to come up and see me after the talk. Unfortunately, the depth of field on this image is not sensational. Uh, so then I decided that OmniWorlds are great and uh, build an OmniWorld-based robot. Um, I've spoken with a few robotics people since, and my decision to use stepper motors uh, to run the four wheels was apparently not so great. Uh, I thought it would be good because I wouldn't have to have wheel encoders because I could just rely on the, the stepping if I didn't actually start skipping steps. But unfortunately, if you're telling it to go in direct X or Y translation, it does snake pretty badly. And they're telling me that basically by using stepper motors, the actual um, the rollers in the wheels are more, far more likely to slip. So you're sort of playing a losing game where you're, you've got your robot on ice effectively. I still think I can compensate with an IMU, but this is an ongoing battle. Um, this was the first thing that started introducing me into high amp robotics because the stepper motors each want two amps. So then you need to get these horrific lithium polymer batteries, which are, um, yeah, I haven't had any issues with them, but uh, it wasn't something that I was looking forward to. So this is the, the robot out of the video that, that, at the start, um, uh, four wheel drive. Uh, you can make a configuration with an extra two in the middle. Uh, Raspberry Pi driven with um, a Wi-Fi aerial, uh, Wi-Fi N on it, and can be totally operated with a PlayStation 3 controller, which it works beautifully inside, but then you sort of stretch the, the limits of what the PlayStation 3 controller is meant to do if you take this on a BMX track, because you notice that it's too far away, and all of a sudden it says, well, your last command was full speed, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Wasn't so bad when they had a two cell battery on it, but a three cell battery, you are moving to try and catch up with it. So consequently, it's great to have people triangulate this thing so that you don't have to try and outrun the robot. Um, a lot of the higher amp robotics, I use the RoboClaw controller, which I've been t talking with the, the manufacturer of our email. Um, and this is a 45 amp per channel. So I've got two motors that can stall at 20 amps. So the controller itself can well and truly handle the amperage because one of the things I discovered when I started blowing up electronics was that if you don't fuse a circuit, part of your circuit is actually a fuse. You just don't know what part. <laughs> so in this case, uh, the battery can handle the current drawer, the wiring can handle the current drawer, the motor controller can very happily handle more than the current drawer at stall. And basically, when it stalls, I'll just get drivetrain damage. So, you know, something will go. But if I can't detect that I'm actually pulling 40 amps per channel and say, hey, I'm up against a fence, just cut power, uh, I've done something wrong, basically. At the moment, this thing runs off a Raspberry Pi 2. Um, and I think in the next slide, I have the upcoming joy for it. Um, I am planning in the next sort of year or two to put this into the NASA Autonomous Robotics uh, Sample Retrieval Challenge. So since this base works beautifully outside, uh, the main thing is navigation outside and detection of objects and then just retrieving them, bringing them back, and that's sort of the qualification lap. I don't know whether I'll go any further than that, but since it took many years for people to actually pass the qualification lap, I'd like to be someone that gets into doing that. Even if they weren't running it, I'd just do videos of doing the, the same thing. Um, a shot of the, uh, the suspension in action, but the video, I think, sort of displayed far, far more of the, uh, the action of that doing donuts and going up hills. This is the, uh, the plan for outside vision, because if in, for inside depth field mapping, the Xbox One Connect is actually really quite good. You get um, VGA. You get 30 frames a second, and you can start building depth maps and building maps based on you know, how far away things are. And there's a whole can of, can of fish as far as building the maps and then doing the DSLAM stuff based on that. Uh, but for outside infrared stuff, there seems to be a much, much larger source of infrared light that's ambient, which you know, the connect just doesn't really like. So if you could turn the sun off for a while, um, but anyway. Uh, doing stereo vision, so instead of just mounting two webcams, I monstered one of the PlayStation 4 eye cameras, which is an interesting act in itself because you're cutting a USB 3 cable and then trying to resolder it, and the signal attenuation on USB 3 is quite fine. 
But the third attempt, it worked. The first attempt, the kernel recognized it, said, yay, you've got a cam, and I could upload the firmware. And then I said, give me a whole stream of images. And it said, you're joking. Um, you're off the USB 3 bus now. So after rebooting, I sort of, you know, resolded and reshielded and eventually won. But I think that image sort of says a lot about robotics, that if you expect to put it together and things that in theory are quite easy to do, as soon as you actually put the electronics down and you say, now I'm going to do this, it's just going to break in sensational ways. And if you're someone who is looking at failure and saying this is not working and you want to walk away at that point, then I wouldn't recommend robotics. But if when it fails, if you have a smile on your face, then you know, robotics is for you. So this is the large 15 kilogram robot which I'm building to become semi-autonomous. Um, people have asked me, what, what do you mean by autonomy? Like, do you want the robot to sort of, uh, you know, be a, a helper? So you're sort of sitting there and it goes and gets you another beer, goes to the fridge, opens the door, gets one out, comes back to you. But that can be easily replicated as a minimum viable product with an ESCII. You don't really need to buy, build a robot for that. Um, a much more interesting one is if the robot is sitting there and I'm going to solder a, a PC board and it sees that I turn the soldering iron on. And just the notion of me doing that, it says, have you got the solder anywhere near you that you can see? You don't. And then scan the bench. There it is there. I'll bring that over for you. So the robot is sort of more of a, a helper, not so much autonomous. I mean, I think the reason that C-3PO is as it is, is because if you know, it decided to fight you, you think you could take it. Whereas if it was a much more aggressive looking robot that sort of didn't move in bodgy ways, you might think it's gonna, it's gonna win. So I don't really want uh, autonomy in that sense. I'd like uh, autonomy in the sense that it can predict what might be useful to me and do something useful. And I can possibly say, you know, if there's a huge pile of stuff, clean up the bench. And it knows, you know, where the hot glue gun goes and it can do that. Which, none of these challenges are that easy to do, but I think, um, the, the current state of affairs of what you could buy, what electronics you can get from China, and what existing software is there sort of enables you to play around in this field. Whereas perhaps like 10 or 20 years ago, it wouldn't have been so easy or, or even really possible. Uh, this is basically the whole drive of the, the robot. Um, I think I'd mentioned that uh, I discovered that the gear motors I was using on it when it became 15 kilos would no longer work on carpet. So you'd basically give full power and it would just sit there stalled. So then I upgraded to uh, 20 amp stalls, 10 foot pounds of torque, and nothing really stops it anymore. Um, but as far as when you're building a robot that moves around, if you want precise control, then you're going to need something like the black box, which has got the brass gear on it. In this case, I've gone overboard and put an eight to one inverse torque converter there. So the, when the wheel rotates, you get eight rotations on the rotary encoder. And the rotary encoder gives already a thousand clicks per revolution. So I'm getting eight clicks per wheel revolution on the robot. And people also inform me that if you use the HAL effect encoders, which you mount a magnet on the back of the shaft and then the rotation of the shaft, the moving magnetic field gets picked up and you can get sort of 12 to 14 bits of accuracy um, plus, if you're using gears, you've automatically got a bit of slop there, but then you don't get the, you know, pseudo steampunk look of having brass and aluminium gears. So you have to trade off the, the look of what you're getting. But the ability to put power down and get feedback saying you're, because it's quite foolish to say you have a, a motor that's going to run at one RPM, and if you run it at full power, you're going to get one RPM. You never do this. Um, if, if you think you do, then you find out a surprise quite quickly. So you need to have the encoders to say exactly how far you've gone when you're putting down this amount of power or half power, and then you can sort of work out where you are. Uh, but also, you're going to want other feedback to do that. That's a side shot of the motors, which uh, when I first got them, I noticed that they were actually bringing other things like nuts and bolts to them. So they're magnetic even if they're not plugged in, which is, was an interesting step up from the, the smaller gear motors I'd played with. And of course, you start playing around with 14, 12, and 10 AWG wire in order to hook up so that you don't burn your wires if you stall your motors for a prolonged period because breadboard wires go up pretty quickly. And the whole robot, uh, in order to do computer vision, um, a Connect can usually saturate a USB 2 bus. So if you have a BeagleBone Black or a Raspberry Pi sitting at the other end trying to do computer vision, you may not get the best results because you're gonna spend all of your time just servicing the Connect. So in this case, there's a quad-core Atom that I'm running, which may even be upgraded to something more, more grunty in the future. And external laptop battery is the aluminium thing that sits behind it. 
Uh, initially, I bought these uh, TP-Link devices, and I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if the robot itself was your access point? So then you could just log into your robot and have a web interface. But even though these claim to be Wi-Fi N, I started running metrics on them because I was doing computer vision and exporting large images over the network and thinking, you know, I, can, I want to be able to see, um, see the slam as it's happening um, there. And with this, I was only getting, depending on where it was, 10 megabits per second. So then I replaced that with an AC600 adapter. And one of the fallacies when I started building the robot was to think that the robot needed to be everything. It needed to have its own access point. Whereas if I bring a robot somewhere else, I can easily just bring an access point as well. So if I take the robot somewhere, I take the same access point somewhere, it logs in as a client to that same access point, and then I just connect to the access point with my laptop. But being able to have a base station um, is one of those sort of mindset changes that uh, can improve network efficiency greatly. Like the difference here is up to 400 megabits. So you can easily see streaming images. Like there's no way before um, a VGA streaming image it was jittery. And now I can do easily 720 or 1080 images over Wi-Fi, which if you're trying to work out what it's seeing as it's seeing it, uh, makes a hell of a big difference. Um, I tried to run this robotic arm using the, the whole robot is using ROS, which is the robotics operating system, which is a horrible misname because it is a whole uh, framework for doing robotics that runs on Linux. And its main thing to run on is Ubuntu. So it's not really a robotics operating system. It's, you know, ROS is not a bad name for it, but uh, the OS part is to be ignored. So they have a, a section in ROS which allows you to control arms when you configure them. And I spent multiple days trying to get this, this arm to work because it's used in industrial automation and it does fun things like if you're building point clouds, the arm will automatically avoid things. So you don't uh, run into yourself or objects that are only transient in, in way of the arm. So I gave that away and decided that it was just trigonometry and wrote a ROS node to control the arm myself. I will go back to trying to use Move It. If anyone knows how to use ROS Move It, please uh, you know, drop me an email. Um, let me know how you got around the modeling problem because I think the URDF was the issue there. Um, this is using a, a nine degree of freedom IMU, uh, much the same that he used on quadcopters. So it knows roughly, well, very precisely what angle it's pointed at and it knows all of the IMU related stuff. If someone touches it, then I get to know about it, which is kind of nice when it's parked somewhere. And at the front, uh, yet another, I have, I think, eight 328s on here now. And this is also another beautiful thing. If you're building a robot with ROS, um, you can compile nodes that run on a 328 and anything else, it's a published subscribe system. So anywhere else in the system, your web interface with JavaScript, you can say, publish this message, and it'll bounce through the main robot and hit your microcontroller. And you don't really have to do serial I.O. programming because UART programming seems like it's good, but it's really not. It's uh, doing serial-based UART programming is, it, well, I've been there with this, and unless, you have, unless you're doing asynchronous serial programming, you're in a lot of trouble because all it takes is one electrical spike and one bit changes in your command, and at the other end, the controller says, this command's garbage. And then you're waiting for a response that never comes. So your robot seizes in place. So trying to do serial programming is not as easy as one would first believe. Um, or as, it's not so much difficult, it's just very fiddly because you need to make sure that every, everything you're doing is asynchronous on the serial so that your road node that's controlling it doesn't stall forever. Um, as I was saying, I have uh, feedback now as the, as the robot's becoming uh, more able to do things by itself having the uh, notion of uh, no surprises. So if it's going to move out of the room or something like that, it telling you that it's going to do that before it starts moving. Uh, whether the microphone died for a moment or not. Um, and also there's things in here which are not so great for um, bringing the robot to show people, like this gear motor. Um, the torque amplifier on this and the fact that it's a, a geared gear motor anyway if you get your tie or you get your finger stuck in between those two gears, you're not going to get it out. Uh, so you need to um, keep a fairly close eye on this whenever anyone's around it. At the bottom of there, I've discovered the mechanical limitations when building robots. The white 3D printed thing hides a slip ring, which works beautifully at USB 1 speeds, and also you can transmit a couple of amps over it. But the bushings in the slip ring are not sufficient to be able to do USB 2. 
So again, you discover fairly quickly what the Linux kernel does when you try and initiate high-speed USB 2 communications and the signal between you and the device is not up to doing it, which is usually four lines in DMessage and the USB bus dies. Uh, but you can get USB 2 slip rings, but you have to pay a couple of hundred bucks for them. So in this case, I'm just going to put another ARM machine, Linux machine at the top with its own Wi-Fi so that it can service that top connect, bounce it over Wi-Fi and the bottom machine can then work out what's happening in the head. So it's much, much cheaper to add a small ARM machine with Wi-Fi than it is to buy high quality slip rings. Um, above that slip ring, there's a, yet another torque converted servo which does the tilt on the pan tilt system. And then by my calculations, this, um, this setup should actually let me hold a fairly decent DSLR in the head at about 45 degrees and not actually have it fall, which is the whole reason of having the, um, the torque converter there and also trying to save the servo a little bit, but it is a reasonably high quality servo. And of course, in the, the head unit, which is yet another bit of U-shaped aluminium, I have another 328 sitting there, which I can flash over the slip ring. And that 328 controls various other little things in the head. And on top of the head, I have two cameras, one of which is a Kinect, and the other one can do 1080 video. So yes, the robot can definitely see what's around it. Um, I got. At one point, I found these on sale, which were basically just uh, three watt LEDs. So it can also cast a fairly bright, um, fairly bright light out in front of it, and buried in the channel behind it, there is a constant current, um, constant current driver. So I can lower the lights and not actually blind anyone, which is kind of nice. Uh, for navigation, uh, initially I started trying to do navigation using uh, RGB, like doing full. Uh, three-dimensional RGB DSLAM, which is lots of fun, but it didn't really work that well for me. So I also now have a fixed connect at the bottom so I can do the, the initial thing that everyone does of taking a projected image of, you know, there is, there's the thing, there's the chair, which is the closest thing to me. What I'll do is just take that and bring it down into a two-dimensional world. So it doesn't so much matter that the chair is only that high. It is an object that is this far away from me and it's the, the closest object that I see. So then you, you bring down the complexity a whole bunch by not having to do things in three dimensions. You just see uh, this is the two-dimensional map of things that I might hit. And you have to obviously take into account for the fact that you're not going to get the tightest move there because the claw at the back might actually easily swing above that chair. But in this case, your model of the robot would have to include the extent of everything in it. So you're not going to get uh, perfect navigation by doing it in 2D, but you're going to get some navigation. And then you can sort of work to improve from there. And for visual feedback, again, initially this became where I put text and stuff, but I've moved that somewhere else. And this now displays what the robot's up to. So if the robot's moving its arm, you get a, a small model on the screen showing the arm, how high it is, where the pincers are, because there's really no way you can see the pincers unless you're on the arm whereas this screen is substantial. So you get to see exactly what it's up to. And if it's pan tilting or if it's about to, to move around or you know it's in distress, you can see it's in distress. And that's again run by a small 328 sitting in behind the screen. Um, the whole front of it I've, decided, I've moved to using small bits of additional u shape channel with microcontrollers that run everything. And I discovered a source for 17 segment uh, displays instead of seven segments, so you can display alphanumeric. And then decided, well, then ran it on a breadboard and saw that there were far too many wires. So I designed a board and had that printed in China. The, on your right is the high and low side driver, which I proto boarded, um, just to cut down on the amount of connections that were being run. So I've since discovered a, a reasonable constant current high, high side driver, but it was just using two transistors, four resistors for a high side switch, and a, um, a GPIO extender, and uh, the ULN28 current sync with resistors in line. Worked out reasonably well for, the, for that, but again, I should stress I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm a software guy. So this is, it's an interesting thing if you wanted to get into electronics and then you People who are electrical engineers look at you and wince and say, what are you doing? Where are your capacitors? What are you doing about back EMF there? And you say, well, you know, constructive criticism accepted. 
And then you get into robotics and mechanical engineers say, you've got a hell of a lot of torque there. Where's the torsion control for that? And you say, well, you know, it sort of works, but you know, any, any recommendations as to how I can fix this would be great. Which has worked in my favor. I've seen people who are doing things and instead of doing uh, servo or gear, gear, gear motor based things, they're actually using proper mechanical leverage. So with a motor that I would never think it could lift 20 kilograms and it's doing it. And I've taken photos and said, great, I'm going to steal your mechanical engineering design. And they said, you know, it's not so much stealing, you can have it, which is even better. And these are some of the PC boards. I haven't, I've yet to make a board that didn't work, which is great. Um, I've made a board where traces have been broken and had to put patches across them, but... Uh, so this displays... Uh, this is actually displaying when, when the claw is in motion. And this is yet another good part about using ROS. If the claw's in motion, you can publish messages saying, I'd like this XYZ to be where your hand is. And it'll work out the maths and it'll do that. But then in this case, you can also listen and say, great, you're moving the hand. I'm listening. I see that message. I'm going to override what's on the screen and let the person see, i.e. you, where that hand is. So you can see the XYZ and the little green dots at the bottom are showing you how far apart the claw, the, the fingers are which there's absolutely no way of seeing if you're in front. The whole thing has a, a web interface, which is... I initially wanted to go straight for autonomous, but then I discovered teleoperating first is far, far better than just assuming that you can do autonomous, because if you have mapping and you don't have a way to actually log in and stop it, you, you, it's very inconvenient, because you're having to pick up a 15-kilogram robot and say, look, you know, don't go out that door. Or, you know, there's a person there, please don't run into mum. It's, it's kind of handy not to run, run into people. So if you can teleoperate and turn lights on and, and display messages and control motion and screen and things like that, and also view the various webcams or the various imaging from there. Um, I was talking to someone and they had worked um, not on the Move It stack, but they had worked on ROS and they said, how do you, how do you move your arm? And I said it was just sort of high school mathematics. And they said, OK, explain that to me. So apologies if you find this particular explanation of robotic arm control to be not so interesting. But this is the backstory. So you're given a um, x, y, z coordinate you want to go to and calculating h, which is basically the reach of where, where you, how far away the effector is going to be from the base. The one angle that's shown there that's not the right angle, the whole robot arm rotates. So that angle, you're sending that robot arm to rotate to that location. And then you take H and you have your, uh, your robot arm. And then you know H and you know Z from the XYZ that you're going to. Um, H and Z form a right angle. So as soon as you have H and Z in the right angle triangle, then you automatically know J through Pyth Pythagoras theorem. As soon as you know J, the length of the arm in the forearm and the upper arm are both fixed, never change, so you know three lengths of a triangle. So if you know the law of cosines, then you know all of the angles immediately. So once you know all of the angles, you can set the shoulder and the elbow. And the only other trick was, you, and initially the mind thinks you can see an arm and you need to know what alpha and beta is and then you can calculate where the wrist is going to be if you want the horizontal. But you don't really need that. You want to have a simpler way to do it is to say uh, you're far more interested in using the HZJ triangle, the triangle that doesn't exist, and then you only have to use add two angles together. And the whole pi on two minus pi thing is to get the, the correct offset relative to where the servo is when it's at 90 degrees. If you'd like more explanation on robotic arm control, feel free to come and see me afterwards, but um, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, so mapping was where it sort of became far more fun. Um, to generate the mapping, I'd always thought, because in ROS you have Gazebo, which is a graphical interface where you can do robotic simulation. And I always thought, if I have a robot, why do I want to do robotic simulation? Uh, but it sort of dawned on me with mapping that you are doing both, really. Um, as soon as you're taking uh, an image of how far away things are, you're then going to build a map, which is more building a simulation of the world and then you move your robot and you say, how far away are things again? So you're taking physical data and putting it back into your model. And if, in this case, if your odometry data that says, this is how many clicks I've moved forward, is slightly off. And if you leave in your simulation how far away things are and you just move forward, 
you'll notice you moving forward and how far away things are, the two things move closer together and this thing should actually stay where it was because the wall's not moving. So you are doing simulation and you're doing robotic control at once if you're doing, uh, when you start doing mapping and things like that. And some data's coming from the real world that you can't really do anything about. Or if you do, then you're sort of cheating uh, because the wall's not gonna move in the real world. You can quite easily say the wall just moved 10 centimeters away, but the robot's just gonna hit the wall then. So, I have a screenshot of that, but basically this is where I'm at at the moment, is playing around and getting, getting movement to work well, and movement to work well in a robot that's not square, because the robot should know that it needs to retract its arm at certain points, or just move to a certain pose where that's fully retracted. Uh, I started playing with mapping a while ago, which is where I discovered that the carpet was too much for the motors that I was using, so then $300 later, it can now move at the right speed. So I should mention that robotics is not only about time and spending lots of time on things that, getting things to work, it's also about spending lots of money, which is uh, lots of fun. So this is the uh, simulation versus reality, um, where in, in, this is the robot visualizer in ROS. So in this case, you can see the really crude model of the large robot that we've been talking about. And the white lines are the two-dimensional projection of any three-dimensional obstructions from the connect. So you can easily turn on the fact that you don't want to have them uh, just keep updating in real time. You'd like them to fade over 30 seconds. So that way, if you move forward, what you're seeing and you're moving straight forward toward it, it should stay where it is. Otherwise, you've got a problem with your simulation versus reality and your mapping is just never going to work. Because if the walls keep moving around when your robot moves around, then it's kind of drunken robotic no navigation. Luckily, it's got wheels, but it's not going to not going to provide good results. Ah, I have videos. And I have a future section. Okay, don't use standard key mappings. Oops. And the full screen. There we go. What I might even do is just mute my uh, audio from the video. I was tempted to try to bring this here, but there's a lot, a lot of uh, wiring that is still fairly loose on the robot, and trying to ship this a couple of thousand k's from near Brisbane to here um, seemed to be one of those fool's gold thing. Um, I've presented it at a conference that was only 10 k's away from where I was, and just moving at 10 k's, um, I had multiple wires that had decided to fall out. So the 51 there is your uh, compass reading relative to north. So as he moves around, that'll change, and the, just at the very bottom of the screen, the 7.8, which the dot in the uh, seven segment display keeps blinking, and then I've discovered that basically this is why there's a white dot on the main screen that keeps blinking. If you don't have things that keep blinking or things that detect that things are frozen, you, seeing stale data is worse than seeing no data. So in this case, I know that the 7.8 volts is what the, the uh, two-cell battery is going to be giving me, um, and I won't run the light pulse really low. The screen above, if I don't have an explicit message, just fades between random characters, um, advancing each character. So you've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it keeps moving that. Here it won't fit because there's a chair just off the right of the frame, so I'm moving, I had just moved the arm back, back in a little bit, and now it's back on its way again, so it doesn't run into that chair. Again, with robotics being all about spending money, the flimsiness that you see when it's turning, it, there's a rear drag wheel which is on six bearings, and that's great until your robot gets to 15 kilograms, and then you think, you know, this is not so great, it is, there's a lot of flex when it's moving over, specifically the little break in that lovely carpet that I have, uh, which you'll just about see when it's trying to turn there, and it'll kick into a little bit of a wobble. But again, I've looked at the site and worked out exactly how to fix that, and that's $100. Uh, put a second drag wheel on, and I'll get much more rigid stability. But there's always things that you want to want to buy and want to bolt on there. so. It sort of depends. If you uh, are wanting to spend money and do technical things that break all of the time, robotics is where to be. I think it just basically moves a bit forward from there in that video. So, 
Ooh, putting that on the wrong screen again. Yay. So in this case, I've uh, got the, uh, the arm going, so you get some idea of, again, there's the, the purple rectangle, which is displaying the arm moving to the right, and it will move to the right on the screen as the arm is shifting. Uh, the arm can either directly go, you know, these are your servo coordinates, go there as quickly as you can, which I really hate, or do sinusoidal encoding. You know where you want to go, you know where you are, and my audio has died. Has my audio died? What's that? Ah, I, I see. So I'd need to sort of be side on. The, this thing, yeah, okay. I'll just leave it, yeah. I'll hold onto it for the next five minutes, that should be fine. <laughs> it's probably better to hold onto it, but I didn't, I sort of missed out on describing what was happening with the, the thing. Anyway, if the, now here where it's moving the Z coordinate down, the size of the rectangle changes. So they're trying to display three dimensions of data in two dimensions. And the rectangles become larger again to indicate that the Z's gone up and the green dots got closer and now it's closed and they'll open up again. Because as you can see from this angle, there's absolutely no way that you would know that the, the servo motor on the fingers was moving. And I think it doesn't actually do anything other than going down again and getting the purple thing smaller. So it opens up a whole area of um, doing pick and place. I have had this arm maneuvering such that uh, breadboard jumpers in a breadboard and having it pick up jumpers and starting to put them in somewhere else, but it's just not quite fine enough that I can say, here's my fritzing diagram. I've put these ICs on the board, you know, please do all of the wiring for me, which would have been lovely, but not, uh, not achievable easily with this sort of level of hardware. Is a little bit easier uh, chained. So the pan, the pan tilt is a little bit uh, less interesting from a screen point of view. I waste a whole bunch of the real estate letting you know it's doing a pan tilt. And the uh, rotation left and right, which as you can see, even at full speed, that motor doesn't really move very fast because it's, if it's not moving fast then it's reasonable power. That does mean that if your finger gets in those gears, your finger is going to become one of the gears. So if you want gear-shaped fingers, then put them near the gears. And the, uh, the tilting, uh, the small blue thing that you can see on the right hand, the left-hand side of its screen uh, will move up and down when I do a move into uh, changing the tilt range. So now it's just tilting backwards to have a bit of a look upwards. But I think I've got it to the point now where, um, apart from, I mean, there's always going to be deficiencies. If you put another rear drag wheel on, it'll have a greater stability moving around. But where it is with the amount of cameras on it and things like that, I think I can do um, things like having it move around the workshop and go and get things for me. So being able to have Sphinx on there and tell it, you know, I would like to have hot glue gun and just sort of sit there and wait for it to go and grab that. Or in theory, actually command hot glue gun five minutes before you're going to want it, which would be even better. So, and now, yay, came back again. So people often ask what I'm going to be doing since I, and during my day job, I'm a software engineer, so I do still write C and C++ code, which is really quite handy if you're playing around with microcontrollers. Um, and I started writing code back in the day when RAM was scarce, like, you know, 128K of RAM was a reasonable amount of RAM. So when other people shudder at you have 2K of SRAM, what are you going to do? I say a lot of stuff. Um, so what, what I may actually do commercially, I mean, search and rescue, I think, is an interesting thing. Um, quadcopters are obviously one of the big things. Everyone loves quadcopters. But if you've got four wheels, then you can probably go further than you can in a quadcopter. So your battery life, and you can carry more battery. Weight's not really an issue. If, it, if an outside robot weighs five kilograms and you wanted to go further, just put five kilograms of battery on it. 
So, and it's not really going to affect performance that much. If your, your motors have a reasonable torque, you can go a couple of hours. Um, hospi hospitality industry is another area which is, is uh, quite useful. You know, if you want to send someone fresh towels, instead of actually having someone go and do that, have the robot go and navigate to the room, press the button, here's your towel. Uh, medical industry is one uh, like the military industry, which I may actually avoid because the amount of um, testing and the amount of uh, litigation that can happen in both of them. Uh, it's not really my thing. Uh, so the outside robot that was in the first really short video going over a BMX track, I'm actually geared up to uh, put that into the uh, NASA Autonomous Rob Robots Challenge. And I was talking with Tridge about uh, using the Ardu Pilot, Ardu Rover code, which at the moment for rovers sort of requires you to have a GPS. And strangely enough, NASA require you not to have a GPS because it's meant to be working on Mars, which they haven't deployed GPS yet. Um, so I, I'll modify that to work with no GPS, with just wheel encoders and areas where you have a robot which GPS is not available. As soon as you go into, into a tunnel or uh, into a car park or something like that. So being able to completely navigate in those areas. Um, my handle on a lot of places is Monkey IQ. So if you want to drop me an email, I'm on the, uh, the Google system of email and also other systems. That's Monkey IQ. Feel free to drop me an email and ask questions or tell me about your robotics. Um, and also, if you want to, although it's Friday, it's a bit harder to do, but you know, fluid of choice, beer, whiskey, green tea, um, whatever it would be, and we can talk about robots. I think that's close to, close to time, so. Thank you very much. Um, with the Ross stuff, um, what kind of stuff does it provide for you? you? You didn't really, or perhaps I wasn't paying enough attention, <laughs> talk about how you ramp up and down your motors. Is that doing any kind of um, PID kind of set point control for you to get that kind of lower but constant velocity? Um, the main thing that starting out with Ross is that it's a, a distributed published subscribe system. And you can also have, I have single files to bring the robot up in navigation and non-navigation mode. So that can be quite complex because you have to kick the connect, you have to run software to do the connect, you have to run up various ROS nodes which are uh, responsible for publishing the connect data. But the uh, publish, subscribe and launch system, the entire framework of getting, have my robot up, I want to see what messages are going between everything. Um, if you're doing PID stuff, I'm sure there's a node that will do PID. The way in which I do uh, sensoidal encoding on the arm is I have, the, here's the output of the servo, and if I want, I can connect that message directly to the joint controller to move the arm to that location. But if I'd like it to be smooth, I can put a shim in between, have something else connect to where it's going, and then issue a thousand instructions to get there. And those thousand instructions then go to the joint controller. So you can rename the paths, so you can say you're at slash camera. But then if you don't want that, you can rename slash camera to be slash raw camera have something, listen to the raw camera, do some image processing and publish on slash camera. And the node that was listening to slash camera to you know, display it or do something else, it's nice and easy to be able to inject things in, uh, into the publish subscribe system. So if you're not going to, like, you know, I'd like to move to, move to using move it, um, but if, if you're not going to do that, you can just accept the same messages that it's expecting and just write your own code. So from my point of view, it's quite easy for injecting nodes that do specific little tasks um, and uh, again, the images for the robot visualization and things like that, I would hate to have write entire GUIs to do that and accept the laser scan data and then do like OpenGL rendering. It's, you know, it's not undoable, but there's no reason to do it if it's already there. So, so motor control is kind of your responsibility? Like you, um, you do that separately? Yeah, they have, if you, if, it, the way in which I do this, I, there's an abstraction in ROS called the robot base controller. And it takes a, a, a speed and a heading and then publishes odometer information. And it's basically, it's up to it as to making that happen. So in this case, to make that happen, I publish things over USB to the motor controller board and say, you know, this is what I'd like you to do. And it has quad, quad encoder listeners and it can actually publish that information back to me. But that's, that's sort of the abstraction for, um, I'd like to move this base off robot at this speed. And then your mapping software above it says, you know, I'm assuming this is all happening, um, and I'll just keep telling you, you know, stop going where you were going, start turning, or 
but more or less, unless it's already supported, you're responsible for, for doing that. Um, the, the, it sounds like Ross is quite, uh, at least quite capable. Um, can it scale down? I mean, in my case, I'm thinking of doing stuff with uh, uh,